Uh, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ashur Hassan. I'm going to be your moderator for this afternoon. Uh, we have an illustrious panel of um, health experts with us today. So uh, I think this is going to be a swashbuckling session. I encourage all of you, and I'm going to actually pick on people, so, so I hope you'll be paying attention, uh, those of you in the audience, not just on the, uh, in terms of the panelists, um, to, to both answer as well as ask questions. So I'm going to start uh, from my left, um, and we'll go clockwise. I'll just briefly introduce the participants, uh, and, uh, um, and then we'll frame why we're here, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, first, to my left, is uh, Dr. Naresh Trehan. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Better He's the... Uh, okay, excellent. Um, he is the founder and managing director of Medanta MediCity, um, right here in Gurgaon, um, and has trained from NYU, so we have a common connection there, uh, as well as practice. I believe you were attending at New York University. Uh, next to him is Jahangir Khan Tharin, a very prominent industrialist in Pakistan, and uh, certainly representative of the private sector here, so thanks for being here. Next to him is Vikram Kumar, I hope I got that right. Uh, he is the co-founder and chief medical officer of Demari, uh, with a R, and um, I've been told that the reason why it was, was named that is because both of the co-founders consider themselves to be brainy. Is that, is that right? I believe so. Okay. We'll find out more about that later. Uh, to his left, is Preetha Reddy, Dr. Preetha Reddy, who is uh, the executive director of the Apollo Hospital System, a very, very, one of the foremost hospital systems in the region. Uh, on her left is Dr. Sanya Nishtar, who is one of Pakistan's most prominent public health experts, um, clearly, uh, and, a, and a global authority on health systems. And to her left is K. Srinath Reddy, who is the president of the Public Health Foundation of India. And I hope I got your pronunciation correct as Perfect. well. Perfect. Excellent. So the reason why we're here to frame this uh, discussion and to frame this conversation is, is to explore the, the idea or the question, which is, can health be a bridge or can collaboration in health be a bridge towards peace, especially in the context of indo pak relations? Um, and to put this question uh, in context, I want to go back or go back in time about six or seven years. Um, uh, there, are, there are three panelists here who, who played a very active role in kind of laying the groundwork or laying the foundation of um, an initiative that we will explore in greater detail called Aman Ki Asha, which means desire or hope for peace. Aman, peace in Urdu. Asha means hope or yearning in um, Hindi. So a very apropos um, phrase. And um, so why don't we, uh, since uh, I like to be chivalrous, at least I try to be, we'll start off with the lady first. So Dr. Sanya Nishler, can you tell us perhaps, um, uh, give us some historical background to the initiative and to some of the collaborations that you've had with your Indian colleagues dating back to 2005, 2006? Well, thank you, Asher. Um, well, the peace initiative that you referred to um, is an initiative, the civil society initiative. And Aman Kiyasha, for those of you who would not understand Hindi or Urdu, means a voice of peace. Um, the initiative is backed by governments on both sides, but it is largely civil society led. And the secretariat is at the media houses, it's the largest media houses on both sides. The purpose is to foster collaboration between people on either sides with a view to uh, promoting trust, building primarily. And the initiative has six channels of communication and conversation, and health is one of them. So Naresh and I chair, uh, co-chair the health side of the track. Uh, and our purpose under the rubric of that initiative is to promote convenings, to uh, promote collaboration, uh, to provide a convening space annually for physicians and people involved in the health sector on either side. Um, and of course, over the last two years, we've uh, hosted two meetings, one in Delhi, the other in Lahore, and this next year round, there are plans for a much lar larger meeting to bring stakeholders from both sides together. Uh, prior to Aman Kiyasha, also, I had the privilege of working with Srinath, um, and I think if you recall, I think was it 2004 and five when uh, I brought two delegations from Pakistan, uh, one to Bombay, the other to Delhi, and Srinath hosted us here. 
and the flavor of those convenings was more ac academic in nature. So the point of convergence was research and collaboration. And, um, but with Naresh and in the civil society initiative, uh, the, the objective is more people-to-people -people contact, mm -hmm. uh, the softer sides of health, bringing the private sector together, bringing, of course, research and academia together again, but bringing a wider constituency of actors interested in health and development in general. So we will take this momentum forward and uh, very much thank the World Economic Forum for giving this, uh, this particular issue space in their program. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Trehan, if you could just to, to elaborate on that, what are your, <coughs> from an Indian perspective, what are your aspirations for this See, uh, initiative? It originates from the belief, long-held belief, that building bridges of peace on the back of science is much easier than it would be in commerce or any other areas where there is there are many hurdles, there are many economic interests, other interests which may override it. When you come to science, and this is why I think that we are getting more traction than we ever expected, is the fact that we are committed to not only our own populations, but we are committed to science at a larger level to provide therapies, treatments, preventions, and everything which are common to both sides or multilateral or many countries. You can take SARC, you can take it on a longer canvas or a broader canvas. The point basically what we are looking at is to say that on both sides we have commonalities. Mm -hmm. On both sides we have challenges which are to a large degree originating from our geographical and demographic uh, conditions not to say our economic conditions. So it is of paramount interest if you will look at it as a humanity to say what can we do and we must take charge ourselves and can we do it better with each, along with each other or can we do it separately. So there, here is the convergence which has happened. And like uh, Sania said, Aman Ki Asha was a good platform because it, is a, it has a continuum. Uh -huh. Many exchanges have taken place, we've held conferences, but then there are like nine day fairs. Mm. They don't get long-term traction. So when you have a platform like Aman Ki Asha, which is on a broad-based, but we in our sector at health are, are, are finding the least resistance to our progress forward, the first two years, like Sanya said, have actually been to converge our thought process, our challenges, our commitment, more importantly, the commitment. So I think that this is this year's upcoming uh, uh, meeting, which we are all preparing for, will then bring out the specific programs which we have concretized and are now saying we let us move forward on a broader front rather than just dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a great, great thing that has happened. The only it's up to all of us to give it life as we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. K. Srinath, um, as, a, as somebody who's been involved in this kind of dialogue, um, are there any areas that you feel uh, where there needs to be more progress or or areas of further discussion and dialogue which could result in, in some concrete, um, you know, tangible interaction? Let me pick up from where Naresh left. Naresh emphasized the importance of science as a very useful bridge to bring people together. But even within the overall realm of science, mm -hmm. health is particularly well positioned to build bridges because that is an area where there is a tremendous opportunity for empathy, compassion, and a feeling of common brotherhood where we can actually sisterhood. work a sisterhood, fraternity, <laughs> to work together. Uh, essentially, I believe that in the area of health, there are a number of priority areas where we can actually jointly advance our health systems uh -huh. and our health services by learning from each other and learning with each other. Uh -huh. uh, for example, in the area of health care, there are a number of areas in which we can actually talk about the innovations that are being developed, which are low cost, high impact, and are helpful at various levels of healthcare, whether it's primary healthcare, secondary healthcare, or specialized tertiary care, mm -hmm. and share those experiences to enrich each other's services. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a specific example of such a For example, innovation? the Lady Health Visitor Program in Pakistan has been an excellent program, remarkably successful in advancing primary healthcare, has even had an impact on mental health by reducing postpartum depression. And in some senses, it has been the inspiration for the ASHA program in India. Mm. 
Uh, similarly, now we are looking at a variety of innovations in primary health care, whether it is conditional cash transfers or IT-enabled uh, delivery of services, which again, we can actually test and share. So there is a lot of experiential wisdom that can be easily uh, shared across. But in addition, there is a great need for joint learning opportunities and joint training opportunities, even in education. We have severe shortages at various levels of health workforce, right from specialist doctors mm -hmm. to frontline health workers and allied health professionals. Now, we can actually have joint academic programs in which we can pool our faculty resources together and then train a much larger number of people. And now, particularly with a variety of distance learning modalities being available, mm -hmm. geographical distance is no barrier. Mm -hmm. So we ought to be able to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Then in the area of collaborative research, there are several opportunities because there are so many pro health problems which are so common to us. Whether you're talking about a disease-related issue, like why are Indians and Pakistanis and other South Asians much more prone to develop diabetes or cardiovascular disease early on? and suffer from it in much larger numbers than other populations. Could I have something to do with sugar mills? Well, uh, we don't know. I mean, I call it the South Asian sweetheart syndrome <laughs> because of the diabetes and the cardiovascular connection. But what are, what are the reasons? Mm -hmm. Is it to do with diet or is it to do with some other areas of propensity? So this is where we can actually conduct collaborative research, which is very useful and uh, will help us answer some problems in our countries. Same thing with health systems research. Sanya, I know, for example, has been doing excellent work on how to use primary health care workers for detecting and treating high blood pressure in mm -hmm. primary health care. Now we are beginning to commence that process. So again, we can do collaborative research. So there are multiple areas. Just to conclude, mm -hmm. I would say in the broader framework, global health is becoming very important in the 21st century. In fact, the ennobling character attribute of human civilization in the 21st century is going to be global solidarity. Mm -hmm. And in global solidarity, there cannot be anything better than health to forge solidarity, to cleanse us of past prejudices, and to help health professionals and civil society partners to become the flag bearers of future friendship. Well said. Um, I'm going <coughs> to pick up on a comment I made earlier. Uh, so Jahangir Saab, if you can um, uh, comment on this. So you're one of the most prominent industrialists in Pakistan. You, you run a number of sugar mills. Your family has a lot of interests in, uh, food and in the food and beverage industry. So potentially you and your family can have a, a, a highly positive impact, in, certainly from a nutrition perspective, which obviously has an impact on health in the country. And, and perhaps, so the question I have is, is, do you see a role for you as a pioneer, a potential pioneer in the private sector a role that could obviously be um, embraced and replicated by your colleagues in India, perhaps, as well, who are in the sugar industry or in the food and beverage industry? Um, let me just sort of explain a little bit about myself. Um, I am uh, basically primarily a businessman and in these sectors, as you have mentioned. But for the last 10 years, I've been a politician and I have uh, had access to being in government and trying to make public, to adapt public policy for change. But just to get to your specific question, yes, there are uh, great potential for people um, uh, in industries like the sugar industry, which is primarily an agro-based industry and is rural in nature. We have about 10,000 people working for us in our various uh, different operations. And we have a serious issue with health-related problems because there is very little um, health care available and the productivity of each worker suffers dramatically, mm. even more so in rural areas rather than in uh, urban areas. So we have taken a lot of initiatives as a part of our corporate social responsibility mm -hmm. in time trying to uh, bring rural uh, primary health care to, to, to areas where we are, we are operating. And uh, the results are, uh, in, in fact, quite dramatic uh, in ways because the change, uh, when you, uh, and the change in the people's health is so dramatic that productivity increases, so it's, it's, it's good for our, for our business as well. <laughs> But going on from there, when we, I, I was moving around in the rural areas and doing what I do, and I'm also into farming, I saw the huge uh, issue of these rural, rural health centers and basic health units that were created by government uh -huh. and not operating, no doctors available, no medicines available. So we took an initiative there and uh, we um, contracted out from government in region to begin with three basic health units and tried to run them. In, uh, within a, in a sustainable system, so that to create a pilot for, the, for reform. 
And as it turned out, it was very successful. This, this is now 12 years in the making. And now there are about more than 2,500 of the, or almost 3,000 BHUs spread all over Pakistan that are being run in this contracting out model. Uh -huh. Same, the budget is the same that the, that the district governments have. And within the same budget, just because that they are contracted out and they're taken out of the system, the system, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so the, with better management, the same amount of money results in hugely more health care. So there are many lessons to be learned, and um, speaking about Pakistan-India collaboration, this is just one population in the subcontinent. We all have the same villages and the same issues with getting health care to the villages, getting education to the villages. Uh, it's a, both are large countries, India much more so. And how do you, how do you get health care to the rural population and to the poor population of both countries? I'm sure there are many models in India. There are many models in Pakistan. Some have worked, some have not worked. So the, um, the collaboration between the two countries is of immense interest uh -huh. and uh, of profit to the population of both countries. Uh -huh. uh, Dr. Preetha Reddy, you represent the, the private sector in India, especially uh, from a health systems perspective. Um, one comment that, that the other Dr. Reddy mentioned uh, uh, was regarding the potential, the success of the Lady Health Worker Program in Pakistan. And this kind of touches upon a theme or broad-based theme here at the World Economic Forum, which is the, the role, the, a, the mainstreaming and the inclusion of women in the workforce, which is, in most, most people would agree, is desperately needed in both countries. Um, in the health system arena, what, what initiatives have you taken or, or Apollo has taken to, to um, gender mainstream women? I don't know if you planned this, but you know, just asked it off the cuff. But um, in the Apollo system, there there are four women who've you know taken on from Dr. Reddy simply because there were no sons. I don't know if there was a boy here. You know, the son might have been answering all your questions. But having said that, I think uh, there isn't too much of a difference between uh, the women as a workforce or, or the men. You know, the gender bias has slowly dissipated uh, in our country, and I'm sure in the neighboring countries it's happening all the time. Uh, one of the points I wanted to make is that I think, you know, between Dr. Treha and Sanya and Dr. Reddy, they've, they've kind of said it all about uh, collaborative efforts between both countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, I think, you know, just as a citizen and as somebody who, who really loves the humanity in both the countries, I'd like to say that uh, the end result, are we looking at peace or are we looking at improving you know, health outcomes in the region? Mm -hmm. And a group of healthcare professionals should actually look at you know, the region as a whole and say that if we can do one to 10 things to really improve healthcare outcomes in this region, our peace might just be you know, a natural corollary. You know, mm -hmm. That might be a problem for others to handle. But I think that uh, if you look at health and if you look at the, the problem of the non-communicable diseases, you know, cardiac, diabetes, mm -hmm. that's going to become a larger epidemic than terrorism of any sort. And, you know, we need to realize that. We have to be aware of that. So I think that to me seems like a bigger and a clear and eminent danger than the fact that, you know, we have to worry about. We have to worry, but, you know, that's, that's a responsibility a certain group of people have, and I'm sure they'll handle it fine. Uh -huh. But we, as responsible human beings, responsible healthcare professionals, maybe we should look at improving healthcare outcomes. Uh -huh. And then say that, you know, as a result of this, there actually has been, you know, cross-border exchange, knowledge, idea, data, research, uh, professionals going across, training each other, because there's so much to learn from, you know, from both healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, I think uh, women are a very strong workforce uh, as far as health is concerned. Uh, you know, you look at the nursing staff, you look at students in medical colleges, uh, more than 50% today seem to be women. Uh, women enjoy working in the, in the healthcare space. Uh, they'll just come to, there may be some things, you may not find a great woman cardiac surgeon I don't know if I'll go to a lady cardiac surgeon, but having said that, I think, uh, you know, they, they are a strong, very strong support system. Very good. Um, I'd like to, um, Vikram, I'd like to touch up, uh, follow up on a comment that Jahangir Sab, uh, made earlier, which is about the constraints of um, healthcare, access to healthcare in rural areas, remote areas. A major issue in southern Punjab, but certainly a major issue throughout 
the, the subcontinent. Um, and you represent, if you will, the, the future generation of tech pioneers and individuals who are really innovating in the e-health or m-health, mobile health arena. How do you see um, uh, the two countries collaborating in a way where we can uh, transcend infrastructural constraints or leapfrog those constraints uh, and work across borders? So, I mean, first of all, I think to answer that question, I don't know if we have the right people in the audience to answer that question. I mean, I think that's a, a technology can do anything. I mean, so that's not really, uh, to me, what's more interesting is um, if, uh, if, if the question is how do you collaborate through, through countries using um, technology, it's, it's not the technology. It's really are the systems open. So what I can talk about is what technology do we write? We write open source software. So I think there's a lot that governance can learn from open source software. and and. And the biggest piece you can learn is communication. I think what open source as a movement and why it's really, it has no boundaries, it has no language, nobody owns it, is the fact that the community has identified with problems that they care about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's critical. And they've found a platform, which is email, a very simple platform where three through people can communicate. So I think in this case, the discussion we're having here, this room isn't gonna change anything. The, the, the discussion has to be a layer lower to how will people, what we're talking about is bringing people to doctors in, in, in both countries, but how can you have people to people? And health as a medium, I'm not convinced that health is gonna really do it because if you think about it, you know, we've all been patients or we're pr practitioners. When you're sick, you think of your health and you, you care nothing more but your health, but you forget very quickly. Once you're better, the last thing you're thinking about is your doctor, your medicine you're supposed to take. So if we're building a sustainable peace model on health, I don't think it's going to long, last long. I think health is, of course, excellent. We all need health. But uh, I'm, I'm not convinced that this is really, and I'd love for the, to hear what the panelists say. I don't think this is where I'd put my money. Sure, please respond. Well, just in response, I don't think we are building a sustainable model for peace with health as the sole entry point. I mean, we all understand and we know from historical experiences that peace is promoted in environments where there are economic interdependencies. So you read the, you know, the history of the unification of Germany and you'll see how the Treaty of Zolverian preceded unification and the promotion of peace in that place. We understand what the underlying dynamics are, which is why trade is being promoted between the two countries as a vehicle for creating the economic interdependencies, which will uh, lead the business communities on either side to prevail upon their governments to exercise restraint and make the right policy choices. You're completely right in saying that health is not just the only, um, uh, only foundation on which peace is being built, but health is a very important entry point. And I want to reflect a little a bit upon what, um, uh, what, what, our, what Preeta has as well said, your, your sister is someone more, more closely known to me. Health and peace have a double-edged relationship. If you look at the history of these two countries, we, we know what the cost of confrontation has been. It has eaten into the fiscal space, at least on our side of the border, the relentless insurgency is an impediment to investment which can propel growth and create jobs. I mean, Srinath will tell you that one of the strongest determinants of health status achievement are per capita income. And as opposed to that, there's very little independent association uh, with, with, of any health outcome with, with the number of doctors or hospital beds. So that is one. People in the health and development community strongly promote peace as one of the key cornerstones of development. Without peace, development is just not happening. And secondly, as Srinath very rightly pointed out, in this new construct of social solidarity, in, a, in an emerging world where collusion and conflict have to be done away with, health is a very good entry point. Now, if I can have uh, your, uh, your permission to have the floor for two more minutes, I think health, uh, uh, um, uh, a bilateral focus on health is not just a nice thing to have. It's an imperative. Mm -hmm. And I think we must understand the gravity of this imperative. Let's look at the geographic proximity. I mean, emerging and re-emerging infections, avian flu pretty much stalls economies, buckles them to their knee. 
I mean, the threat of polio is just not over. I mean, in Pakistan, we are just not able to eradicate that. Every, um, every um, summer, and Jahangir will tell you, when there's a dengue outbreak, there's complete havoc in our country. And infectious diseases do not need passports to travel across borders. We sure. have to converge on this basis alone. Mm -hmm. On the issue of geographic proximities, look at the issue of counterfeit medicines. I mean, if there's a... If there are price differentials of two diseases, there's complete dumping of medicines on either side of the border, as, it, as, is, uh, as is for agriculture commodities, as you would know. Mm -hmm. So for these geographic reasons is, uh, alone, we need to talk to each other. We need to talk. We, uh, the, the policy sides of health need to speak to each other. Then this is not alone. I mean, we belong to a common gene pool. And what is relevant to us in terms of the threat of non-communicable diseases, what's uh, relevant in the space of epidemiological trials and all, does not have to be duplicated. We have to uh, facilitate comparative advantage and exploit synergy. I mean, I can continue to go on and on. Both the countries have a post-colonial imprint in terms of how their health systems are orientated. We are both federations and we have similar set of issues. Uh, and I think it's complete wastage of money for us to be doing, uh, building on what you said, an evaluation of contracting out reform, uh, and for the Indians to be doing that on the other side, when we know perfectly well that our health systems are so deeply rooted and grounded in the same similarities. So I think that we should not think of the conversation around health and development as something nice to have. It's an imperative. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, other than that, it, we, we are going to capitalize on a huge dividend uh, and for any government not to uh, capitalize on this opportunity uh, on either side uh, would be an opportunity missed. Srinath. Well, health ministers are not going to be signing peace treaties and no war pacts. Mm -hmm. That is certain. However, if you want to people-to-people -people conversation and confidence-building measures, health is an excellent area to begin with and to consolidate. And I think that's what we are really urging. And even in terms of technology, there is no reason why technology can foster conversation, why we cannot foster conversation and a better understanding of each other and sharing of information. And health is an area where IPR is not a, usually a barrier. And you can actually share a lot of experience, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the accumulated wisdom of all the work that's gone on in each of those countries. And secondly, remember, globally, healthcare costs are escalating. Budgets are now being busted across the world because of unaffordable healthcare costs, including in the United States. People are looking to countries like South Asia, regions like South Asia to become innovation crucibles of low-cost, high-impact healthcare. So we can jointly together actually become that crucible. And there is no reason why our work together cannot foster both economic prosperity as well as better understanding among people. So technology, too, is a tool that can be utilized appropriately in the health sector. Mm. So. You, you mentioned something which, I, which was very important, which I'd like to uh, get your comments on, which is uh, the, the importance of people-to-people -people interaction. Um, we, we know, or we, we've, ex we've observed in the past, that especially in the, uh, that the importance of patient support groups, for example, patients who have cancer, being able to share information with one another. Um, is this something that is part of your part of the med medical city that you're creating, or yes. is it something that, what's, what are your views on this? If you look at the larger picture, mm -hmm. you must layer it first. The basic thing what we are talking about is right now, that we, if by not proceeding on this platform, that opportunity that we have, we are going to lose out, all of us. Okay. So that is a given and very well articulated by everybody around the table. Also, it's well established that it's a great entry point and a great vehicle to promote what has not been able to be accomplished in the last 60 years. So we don't have to theorize about that. The point really is that at our level of our own needs, we need to collaborate to set an example of how trust can be built between the two populations. We have a great opportunity. I'm a dreamer. That's the nature of the animal. I would not say it is far off to say within the next five years we have an agreement where we recognize each other's medical degrees, where the curricula are quite similar. We respect each other's education system and contribute to each other and build two hospitals across the border, 
run jointly by Indian and Pakistani physicians on both sides. These are visual, visible examples of what sharing can do. You have to come up with these small little ideas uh -huh. which will then promote that trust. The, what, is, what is our problem? We, are, we know we are destroying each other. We know we are depriving ourselves. But that trust deficit is what is the, the core of this problem. So I think that there is no doubt in my mind that if we dedicated ourselves diligently, civil society, private sector, government, everybody, and said, look, yes, this is an opportunity, maybe we can do what we can do. I mean, nothing may happen, but doesn't mean that we should not do. And that uh -huh. reminds me of the story that uh, that lady who unfortunately passed away, who won the Peace, peace Prize from, was it Nigeria or Bengali? I don't know the right person. So she gave that story. She said that there was a raging fire in a forest. Uh -huh. All the big animals, giraffes, rhinos, lions, everybody's running like mad, trying to run away from the, uh, from the fire. And they look up and they see this little hummingbird up there flying to the river, picking up a drop of water and putting it on the fire. Again, to and fro, to and fro. And they all laughed. Naturally, they did. So they said, what the hell are you doing? So she said, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm the, doing the best I can. So I think that to, to be cynical about something, that whether this will get the traction possible, we can sit here and give up on it, or we can say, let's go down with all the commitment that we can put together, recognizing the fact that the fundamentals are very strong. If we do that, then I come to, then there is success, the chances of success are, are huge. Second, I come to what Srinath touched upon was technology. Uh -huh. If you look at it, don't only look at South Asia where we are almost <coughs> 1.5 billion people. Look at 5 billion people around the world who are deprived of healthcare. Uh -huh. Okay, so what does it do for us? It solve, we, it's an attempt to solve our own problems create new innovations for, for high-impact, low-cost models, and then be the actual uh, uh, leader for the rest of the 5 billion people to access health. What are we doing today? We are, we are master copycats, and I'm one of them. It's like I trained in America. I learned everything there is to do. I can do it better than Americans, of course, but that's different. But then I'm still a copycat. I did. I transported that medicine here, which we say is very effective. It is effective most of the time. It is very invasive because all three things we know is either we cut it out or we poison it or we shoot it with an X-ray beam. Mm -hmm. But it's very expensive. Huh? So we are saying if America is not affording what they are inventing and we are copying it, then we are on a suicidal track. So we need to reinvent medicine. We need to look at, while we are plugging in all these gaps, we need to re rewrite the blueprint of healthcare delivery in our own continent first and then maybe transport it to beyond our borders. So I think there's a great opportunity here, much more so than any economic discussion will take place. So, because um, you also know that healthcare is the second largest industry after agriculture. Mm -hmm. So it's not a small little effort of, of, of trying to do cottage industry. Mm -hmm. It is a huge opportunity for us, and we may be the leaders of the world eventually because we have so much traditional medicine in our, in our genes. Actually, you look at Ayurveda. I want to just get in about, so l let me be clear, I'm not cynical, I'm just practical. <laughs> and everybody, of course you'll say we need healthcare. I'm you run sure a hospital, a you run a hospital. Down practicality, of course, but, you, but practicality no, my, my, never works. No, absolutely. My point is we need to break it down a level. And I never knew, actually, I've heard of Aman Kiyasha. I work in healthcare, I work in health IT. I never knew Aman Kiyasha had any health component. Mm. What is it affecting the people is what I'm saying. And for that, absolutely, health is a great place to start, but there's got to be a lot of work to bring it lower. So how do communities so care? So maybe disseminating it through your no, so, mobile so, phone platform. So let's platform, think further. Right? So I, I yeah. thought hard. I said, you know, peace, what could health do? So a donor marrow program, for example. To your point, absolutely we have genetic similarity between the countries. We have difficulties. If it's already there, it should be talked about. It should be, that's a, to me, an example of a very concrete, practical mm -hmm. example of how, yes, you can get a community to say, look, somebody from this village has saved my life. It's not that a hospital has served them. It's business to people. I'm saying people to people. And it can happen, but I think we need to br bring this, this conversation one level lower to, to, to people to people. So Jahangir, uh, Tareen, and Rita, what would it take for an Apollo and a Shokat Khanum or a Aga Khan University to come together and create a joint venture 
cross-border where, where exactly this type of interaction and collaboration can happen? You know, we kind of said it in, in many different ways, but the people-to-people -people connect is there because, you know, between all the health systems in India or the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, we're working with some of the, fan, uh, the really good cancer facilities in Pakistan, the connect is there. It's there between the clinicians. It's there between the staff. Uh, it's not institutionalized, you know, it's it's like a single initiator between two people. Uh, patients come to India, they go back, and then the families connect with each other. I think all that has been happening over the few over the past few years. I try to say that, you know, if we can really do like a pilot or a model and say that for this community, we would work together. You know, doc, doc, Dr. Frehan kind of said the same thing that there would be one hospital in India and one hospital in Pakistan, and it would be managed same way, same SOP, same benchmark, same outcomes, that, that would be a model. Or if we just took two communities, you know, mm -hmm. if we took, um, uh, like, let's say a rural community in, in both countries, mm -hmm. we used all the learnings which, you know, both of them have, and put it there and, and really seriously monitor clinical outcomes. Then that would be a a model for the rest of the world to emulate. If uh, maybe healthcare providers are, you know, allowed, people from India are allowed to go and set up hospitals in, in Pakistan, that's fine. Uh, you know, people from Pakistan wanting to come and do hospitals here. I, th I think all these models have to work together. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can have uh, clinics, if we can have rural clinics, if we can have telemedicine linked up with technology, data which is seamless across the borders, data which is used tomorrow for research. Uh, and why are we constricting ourselves to research just, you know, with, with India and Pakistan? Maybe we can take the same data and share it with, you know, Stanford and Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe they've reached some level and they really want this genetic pool to make a difference. So I think we need to just take uh, mentally say that, you know, the borders are there, but from a healthcare point of view, point of view from clinical outcomes point of view that you know we won't worry so much about the about the divide and say that mm -hmm. let's really do something substantial you know they've done two three years of phenomenal work on oh. this aman kiyash and i'm i'm kind of surprised you know it hasn't been everyone doesn't know about it but i think people in the healthcare space are really reading a lot about it and uh, admire the work which is which is being done of course, there's never enough in healthcare. Sure. You know, you think you've reached, you've won some battle, and there are ten more things which you which you have to deal with. The baby but steps I, first. But the baby sure. steps first. You know, the little drops first. Maybe the mm -hmm. you know two communities come together and say, let's really monitor health outcomes. Let let's look at cardiac disease, diabetes, cancer, mm -hmm. all these things which are bothering us, and mm -hmm. see if we can make a difference. Thank you, John Gersa. Yeah. I would like to bring another dimension to the discussion <clears throat> regarding healthcare collaboration and peace, ultimate peace. You know, <coughs> the generations now in, in Pakistan, young generation and even uh, up to my age, we have grown up in Pakistan without any connection to India, and a similar thing has happened in India without any connection to Pakistan. When, uh, when cross-border activities take place, mm -hmm. and especially in the health sector, which is, the, I think, the, the health and education are the two most serious things that affect each population. When cross-border uh, um, Aman Ki Asha type of initiatives take over, you come into India and realize how many of the problems of India are similar or exactly the same as the problems in Pakistan. Let me give you a personal example of what happened today. I got up in the morning, I opened the paper, I read about dengue in India. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have been facing for the last three months in Pakistan. I had no clue sitting in Pakistan mm -hmm. that dengue is such a serious issue in India as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I leaf through the paper and I come across an article on sanitation. And sanitation is without, good, without taking care of sanitation. We are not ever going to fix the health problems of, this, of both countries, but they're exactly the same. Villages uh, are, don't, do not have enough access. If, government, if the public sector comes in and puts in sanitation schemes, they don't work, they get clogged, and so there are solutions in Pakistan regarding sanitation. The Akhtar Hamid Khan, Dr. Akhtar Hamid Khan is, is a very famous social scientist who set up uh, something called the Orangi Pilot Project in Karachi, and uh, you know, this little slum population of a million people took, took uh, sanitation in their own hands, and he helped them technically. 
and they, they all live with the, the, all, the entire problem was resolved and now we have taken that into into rural areas of, of Pakistan also and I remember that there was a sanitation meeting on sanitation arranged by at probably the World Bank in which we uh, our people from Pakistan came to India exactly the same problem so the point is when you realize that we may be different countries and we may have had a very adversarial relationship for the last 60 odd years but at the end of the day, we are the same people, uh -huh. we have the same problems, and so therefore similar solutions. This is a huge bridge to peace. Can, can I just speak further on that? Uh, and I completely agree with him. You know, there's something so romantic about Pakistan, India, because we travel all over the world. But when it comes to India, you know, there's this, you know, there's what I would like to call the proximity of the distance. Mm. You know, I crossed the Baga border yesterday, it took me two minutes to cross. Um, and it takes you such a long time to make a journey. And you're really yearning um, to cross over on the other side because you know mm. that the people over there mm. are ethnically similar. You come from the mm -hmm. same uh, gene pool. Your grandfather's house was on this side of the soil. Uh, you speak the same language. When Srinath and I meet in international meetings, we are on the same wavelength. We speak the same language. We eat the same food. And, and unfortunately, there's this distance. We did, at, our, at my organization, we did an, an assessment of the nature of collaborations uh -huh. over the last 60 years. Uh -huh. And I tell you, we stopped counting them. We looked at, uh, uh, we looked at peer reviewed literature, we looked at grade literature, and we did key informant interviews using the snowball technique. And the collaborations fell in three categories. One was the one to one relationships. The other were the more the SARC or the South Asia type relationships. Then, of course, there were initiatives where multilateral agencies convened regional groupings or where uh, overseas Western agencies and uh, ac academic organizations brought us together in South Asian uh, convenings. Uh, <coughs> but in each one of them, and this is what we dug out from the informant interviews, in each one of them, the, the bottleneck and the impediment were three. Uh -huh. There were visas. Number two, there was a mistrust, uh, you know, by certain extreme elements from, from, uh, from either side of the border, not by the, by, by the major bulk of the society. And then, of course, the, uh, the impediments to the fi financial transactions. So if Srinath Sri and I apply for a joint grant, there's no way I can send him the money. It's going to take me a month to get a visa. Uh, and of course, there will be mistrust, uh, mistrust from both sides, uh, unfortunately, uh, for different accounts. There's one thing that I have learned uh, from reading history is that there's some societies where the nature of the confrontation actually seeps down to the level of the society. Uh -huh. And I don't want to name those, but there are some societies where confrontation sows the seeds of hatred between people. I have never come across a single Indian where I get that vibe of hatred. Oh. You know, this confrontation, this confrontation is costing us uh -huh. on both sides of the border. It is costing us a lot. Innocent oh. people are dying in the process and are being deprived of essential facilities. And we really have to look at things in a very different way. And all we are saying, of course, people like us come from this little world of health. We really do not have leverage over and beyond that. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is back to your story of the hummingbird. I think whatever we can do is, is something that we should. I was flying from Beijing two days ago, and, you know, the Secretary of Social Protection of Pakistan was, uh, was on the same flight with me coming back from India. And, you know, he, he told me, he said, we've got um, the Benazir Income Support Program where they've done some very transformational work on uh, developing a database, you know, which is now a national asset. Uh, it doesn't have to do with one government. It will remain a national asset. Uh, and on the other side of the border is RSBY, who've done some very transformative work in, uh, in ascertaining entitlement. And we immediately got to the drawing board. So this is a perfect fit. We can learn something from them, and they can tap into uh, our expertise. And there are thousands of examples like this. But we really have to make those connections, those connections uh, in terms of geography, in terms of visa, in terms of uh, fiscal systems, in terms of monetary integrations, and most importantly, in terms of trust. So people like us who are humbled with 
um, you know, with some level of uh, good name that we've created over the years, have to stand up and say that we subscribe to moderate views in our, uh, mm -hmm. in our part of the world, that we want to extend a hand of friendship to all the neighbors around. Uh, and, and, and this cost of confrontation really has to come down. Well said. Let's uh, start making some connections mm -hmm. in this room. Um, if you can uh, please uh, ask a question, uh, and, uh, don't, uh, not a comment or a statement, um, but we do encourage you to ask thought-provoking questions based on what you've heard today. So, Menaz, Aziz, let's start off with... Before you said that it has to be a question. It does have to be a question. Um, well, uh, one, one can put it as a question. You know, it's, it's more of a visa question coming to uh, a, a, a level of collaborative question. You know, I, I didn't know about uh, the Aman Kaisha uh, health initiative. I knew about because I'm not from the health sector. But uh, I know is that, that very, very poor people, when, you, when we are talking about bringing it down, very, very poor people bring their children to India mm -hmm. for heart surgeries. Mm -hmm. Because that's something very specific and it's very cheap in India. And, uh, you know, so, so there is this, uh, either they get into, onto a bus or to the railways and they do get. And how, I will put this to the forum, it's, it's uh, something um, like very tangible that how do you get easy access to visas or are there any kind of easy access to visas possible? I had to put a question. Right? <laughs> that's a question, it's great. I can Glad that you asked. Yeah. I can answer that. Yes, please go ahead. See, one, one thing in spite of the uh, process through which one has to go to, to get a visa, that there is a medical channel which the Indian government at least has put, for, put forth, and each embassy has had the same briefing to say that when they have the appropriate medical background uh, papers and a letter of, from the corresponding hospital here to say that, yes, we have registered this patient, visas become very easy. So you know the children that you alluded to, we have all these programs where we not only try to subsidize the treatment, but there are at least few hundred children that we do free from Pakistan and different of our institutions. So that has been an ongoing program, and it's very encouraging because you do read news reports of families and all that expressing their, uh, their uh, view on how this, we are helping each other. The basic thing from that I would say is that there is no reason, and it looks like the, the environment is clearing a little bit on both sides. It, it seems like that. It's a very encouraging moment, and we can be the agent also to encourage that process. And I think what, what is happening here today is in public that we are actually renewing the vows of, of this uh, movement, but it also, Sanya, I would say particularly that it also behooves us to now put a lot more energy now that we have our own vehicle to travel on top of the platform of Aman Ki Asha. If we continue with this conviction and try to bring down, bring out these models that we are talking about at all levels, uh, public health, whether it's public-private partnership, whether it is collaborative effort across the borders, or more importantly, and I think Srinath would be the right person to carry it to the government level, is to say what is the impediment of progressively recognizing each other's educational degrees. Because not only in, in health, but maybe in, in others, but we can start with health, because it's easily documentable, and then we can, you know, we can move this along, which would be a great gesture, and I don't think has any danger attached to it. Just, so I think to, take, just to take the discussion along on the visa issue, let, there, there is some good news coming. Uh -huh. Um, the, the, for the foreign secretaries of both governments have met. They have negotiated for a while. And the, a much easier visa regime has now been, I think, agreed upon. And it is now awaiting permission, final approval of cabinet in Pakistan. I know that for a fact. And believe me that these initiatives like Aman Ki Asha and other collaborative initiatives where the population of both countries have, uh, have met, have gone to each other's country, have played a significant part in the fact that we have been able to uh, negotiate visa uh, uh, removal of some visa restrictions and bringing the two countries so, together. So I'm, I'm born in Karachi. So every time a, a new passport guy comes and looks and says, how can you be born in Karachi and be an Indian, not, not noticing I was born before the partition. So, so, so maybe that's the reason why, why I'm more on, on the other side of the border. Uh, you, you know, just a footnote to what uh, Naresh elaborated very nicely at, and in, in response to Menaz's question. 
There is a Naman Ki Asha track, which is funded by Rotary International, which is dedicated specifically for bringing children uh, you know, with uh, pediatric cardiac problems that cannot be operated upon in Pakistan across the border. And I wouldn't know off the cuff of the number of children who have been brought uh, with financing from that side, but they have been brought, they have been treated uh, with funding from Rotary International, with whom we have the privilege of partnering with. So, of course, there are these channels, and we hope that they will deepen with time. And just to answer your question, uh, Sports Interaction uh, is, is another platform that has been used. So there's this cricket di diplomacy, which, is, which has been, where, where there's been a lot of movement on. And apparently there is going to be a series between India and Pakistan starting, I think, the 25th of December, I believe. Well, don't and talk about peace then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that brings out the worst in us. <laughs> Um, but a friendly rivalry, friendly. Um, yeah, but that's on a, on a lighter, friendly note. Yeah, and apparently there will be liberal, liberal visas will be issued liberally for Pakistani supporters to come and cheer uh, these matches. Um, other questions? <coughs> we haven't heard from this side. Ashwin. I think uh, what we have seen today, even uh, private healthcare, uh, both in India and Pakistan, is largely upper middle class, upper class. So is there, uh, you know, from both sides, are there efforts to sort of look at the affordability uh, question, right? Because a significant portion with whatever we do is still out, out of reach of, of getting into private healthcare or a good, good, good type of uh, uh, public system. I was alluding to that only when I said See, we big impediment for us has been that technology innovation has not taken place based on our needs. The reason is that there is investment required, and if the critical mass is not there for utilizing that technology or buying that technology, it never takes off. So what I'm saying is that now if we recognize that one, we have over 1.5 billion people in, on the subcontinent, and even if you took 10%, 20% of that population, it becomes a huge population which can initiate the first innovation process. Of course, then it will go down. Now, my personal belief is that, look, we are, on the, we are on the wrong side of medicine, like I alluded to earlier. There is such a huge wealth of traditional medical systems, health systems available in our country, which got sidetracked for lack of scientific validation. We've already started the process of taking herbal remedies or extracts and putting them through the same paces that our pharmaceutical industry has to go through to be able to validate uh, the efficacy, the bioavailability, and all these other stuff. And we've had some very good early success. In, in Parkinson's, you will not believe, I, I will show you, we can always show you some documentation of these films, where the rigidity that is associated with treatment of Parkinson's with uh, L-DOPA and other drugs with Ayurvedic oral and, and uh, uh, oil massages and all that, the rigidity goes away dramatically. So there are many, many re remedies that we, we and my favorite example is that if you, have a, if you have an infection, throat infection, you take X amount of antibiotics. So Augmentin will give you 99% relief from your infection, but 30% will have GI symptoms, 100% will have a big hole in the pocket. Okay. So if there was a synergy between which you could find, and I'll just take one more minute to give you that example, is that we in modern medicine believe that is the body, it's ailing, I got the means from outside and I'll put it inside your body and treat you. Ignoring completely the strength of the body to heal itself, which was the basis on which homeopathy and a lot of Ayurveda and other traditional Chinese medicines are based on. So I'm saying that if we can fuse the two, if we can use the power of the body to stimulate its immune system or boost whatever we have, what we can boost, and I don't have the full knowledge yet, and then use the outside methodology to, to, to combine the power of the two, maybe we can reduce the half the dose of the antibiotic, reduce the side effects to half, and also reduce the cost. We are about to start a, a big program, uh, where, uh, the, it, and it comes out of a government institution, that all the trials on this herbal stuff has been done up to up to preclinical which we call animal trials and all that and it is holding promise that it will increase the efficacy of cisplatin which is commonly used 
in uh, cancer treatment by improving or, or enhancing its efficacy by 2x. So you can imagine how much cost you and side effects you can, you can take out of the same. So there are many, many things that we need to look at afresh. And that is why I think that the future of medicine that we invent for that 5 billion people will be the new era medicine, which I hope will come out of India, certainly not in my lifetime, but hopefully in Sirinath's. <laughs> Uh, firstly, I think we have neglected the whole issue of affordability in our health planning. Mm -hmm. Though the intent was there in the beginning, it fell into neglect because of the way our health services have been structured and financed. And now we are now looking at universal health coverage and the framework of universal health coverage is now being developed and debated in India. And I'm sure similar movements must be going on in Pakistan as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we ought to be able to really look at how to reconfigure our health systems to enhance affordability. At the same time, we must also learn not only from each other's strengths, but also from each other's mistakes. We have neglected primary health care substantially and disconnected it from secondary and tertiary care, and thereby increasing the load on secondary and tertiary mm -hmm. care of what were eminently preventable and treatable at the primary health care level. So that is something that India has paid the penalty for, and we ought to repair it. Similarly, in Pakistan, in their zeal to decentralize, they dispense with some of the federal regulatory agencies and when they dispensed with the federal drug regulatory agencies, suddenly there was a spurt of counterfeit medicines in Lahore which claimed a number of lives. Uh -huh. So we have so much to learn from each other, both from the strengths as well as from the mistakes, so that we can actually build up sturdier health systems which are affordable at the same time. Uh, and just on that same note, you know, the, as Srinath rightly said, uh, you know, there are these big ticket endpoints, health systems endpoints of access, you know, geographic access and financial access and quality and cost. And of uh -huh. course, there are these big ticket recipes of reform to address them. But one of the things where, which creates another imperative for us to learn from each other, or at least to join, brainstorm together, is the issue of the private, role of the private sector in health service delivery. I mean, not all private sector entities operate with the quality standards of Medanta and uh -huh. Apollo. I mean, you have a range of private sector entities that the state does, has absolutely no handle on. Uh -huh. So th they work in different systems of medicine. There are all kinds of infrastructure. Uh, they are what we call described quacks. There are health providers who are providing services for which they're not qualified. Um, and this particular issue, what I like to call the mixed health system syndrome, you know, the syndrome of the publicly financed and government provided services coexisting alongside the privately provided services where out-of-pocket payments are a major means of health financing is something uniquely endemic to South Asia, India and Pakistan in particular, uh, an, an area which has been a, a very poor area of research. And uh, as we hopefully chalk, you know, in our conversations, uh, chalk a research, research agenda forward, uh -huh. uh, I certainly look forward to this being one of the core areas. But on a slightly different note and picking upon an earlier thread of the conversation, uh, I think you ought to be at that Aman Kiyasha Health Forum table, you know, on those convenings where people listen to each other's presentations, see a synergy immediately, want to draw on a comparative advantage and run with the, run with the collaboration immediately. And we hope to showcase some of them uh, when we come to uh, Delhi next year. We all year. look forward to an invitation. Certainly. Uh, one last, time for one last question. Yes. So we're concerned about the Indo-Pak divide. And uh, Nareshu just talked about the expensive allopathic and inexpensive homeopathy, for example. Which is the bigger divide? <laughs> so... So if you were to convert it into that, we, I think we suffer from the same syndrome. And uh, the divide, whether it's homeopathy or other traditional medicine, the divide is huge. And we are largely responsible for it because the practitioners of modern medicine hit Ayurveda and other forms of medicine with such a big stick that they actually froze. So now when you reach out, and first of all, I'm uh, one of the few who, who even wants to think like that because I'm often criticized about how I want to give away our domain. But the basic thing is when you reach out to homeopaths and Ayurveds, their first concern is that what is your motive behind trying to engage with them? 
Is it to destroy them further or is it to really do you believe in the value of it? I, for one, am a believer and I've seen hundreds of examples of how it has worked together. And I, I think that there is, this is just my own belief and I, I have no, nothing to say, other people should start believing it till we prove it, that there is so much synergy between these different forms. Homeopathy becomes a little difficult to scientifically validate because of the fact that it's a nano dosage kind of description that I found. But herbal, you must understand, has huge, and you must understand also that a large part of our pharmaceutical industry also came from that herbal. They may have synthesized it, but the roots are in those roots. So I think that there is a just a will, and I'm just waiting for a few solid you know, provable examples where we can put it together that I think that with the, the mind will change. Why? Because human behavior changes maybe for larger good of society, but, but more so for your own good. And if the, if the question that was asked about the cost and the fact that we can bring down the cost and treat many, many, many more people, we will not suffer economically, we will gain economically. And once that is permeated into people's heads, I think it will get much more traction. Today, we are so used to going at the same time in the morning at 8 o'clock and doing the same thing, repeating, writing the same prescriptions. The pharmaceutical guy will get, come and give you the new miracle. But it's all destructive as far as I'm concerned because we are on a suicidal path. America has shown it. Srinath just said many countries have gone bust. And then, so what we are saying is, we may not, we, I mean, we, we may be bust already, but the basic thing is that one billion people who are out of the health net, and they are depending on quacks and all these, my own servants from my own house think I'm a quack, because they think that you want to do blood tests and you want to do chest x-ray before treating them. They want to go to that neighborhood quack who gives them one poke and they somehow feel better. So I think that there are many, many battles to fight on all fronts. But again, it's a building block. 50% of the disease burden can today be reduced by just primary, sanitary, drinking water, all this is all the, the cliche that we talk about every day, but we haven't done anything about it. Second is the point that we, there is no education. There is no education about disease. So we, we will see patients come in with, with totally advanced disease, which is incurable, but if we had means of early detection, we could decrease the, decrease, uh, the disease burden or the cost burden hugely. So where do you start? That's one point. But today, just to keep the focus on our engagement, that in, we pick out some of, the, some of the quick fixes. Because nothing like if you can show some results, uh -huh. then the, the, the belief is renewed regularly. And that's what we are working on, that we want to announce on the, in the March-April meeting that we have the following four or five fronts which we have done all the basic work on, and we can now collaborate to start working and show some quick results on these things. So we look forward to, to that evidence of uh, yes. uh, 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 the, the real tangible evidence. Um, I want to thank all of the uh, participants, uh, of course the panelists uh, who uh, shared their thoughts and views, uh, as well as all of you for, being, uh, for taking part in this discussion. Uh, I just wanted to make a housekeeping announcement that the buses will be leaving for uh, Dreamworld, is it? Is that the right name of the place? Kingdom, Kingdom of Dreams. So to, to your point, we're all dreamers. And as John Lennon said, you're not the only one. Uh, so we're now going to go from this dream world to a real dream world, Kingdom of Dreams. Um, Very exciting. Highly recommended. Excellent. Look forward to it. So thank you once again. And uh, just uh, uh, I'd like all of you to join me in giving the panelists a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.